years. And it's pretty rare that you ever see a CRM that really has any community. And so it's a, kind of a special, special thing that they've got going on there, but they've done a really good job documenting uh, some of the common questions. Some of these questions I've seen reoccurring inside uh, Discord. So I figured I'd share that there in the chat for you guys. Anyways, um, before we get into it, a couple housekeeping things. As you guys know, we rolled out the tickets for our event. So for those that don't know, we're doing our first real live in-person event. Well, actually not our first. We did do an event here in San Diego in July. We had about, I don't know, 15, 20 people show up to that. It's very last minute, very impromptu. Uh, but we've been planning this big in-person event for probably the last four months. months now state um for some inland there's probably not as many as there should be i think we're gonna do things a little bit different right when you look at how a lot of events are set up typically you'll go pay you know maybe a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars and you're gonna get some education but typically there's gonna be some upsells sprinkled in right you're gonna get this big pitch at the end of the event to go get into some high ticket whatever um you're going to get some some information they're going to do some some breakdowns of different strategies or ideas typically it's stuff that you've heard before um and usually like they have some filler right so maybe at night you go and do top golf or you go and do some x y and z um little event they put together and frankly a lot of the cost of the ticket ends up going to those kinds of things and so we said hey we're not going to do that we're not going to do over the top catering at the event we're not going to take you guys to some goofy top golf uh evening chit chat we're really going to do a few things a we're obviously going to double down on content that i think is going to be valuable this is not going to be a repeat of what you guys have heard us talk about inside the leah program a lot of what we're going to be sharing is more story based right and you can take anecdotes away from those stories and it's going to be stories for me stories from leah coaches and we brought in a really cool guest speaker lineup so i'm going to give you guys a couple breakdowns on um who we have on this guest speaker lineup and give you guys an outline of topics. We'll get this queued up here. Uh, all right. So some of these times are, are set to potentially change a little bit in terms of how we have everything slotted. There's been some, hey, can I speak at this time opposed to this time? So this isn't going to be in perfect chronological order. Uh, we're going to have a, a land investor come in and talk about how he's bought over a thousand properties without ever sending direct mail. You guys are going to kind of see the, the more creative side of building a land business, the less of the cookie cutter, send mail, send text, get deals. I always tell people there's a lot of ways to make money in the land business. And Peter, who will be speaking on this topic, uh, is just a, a real testament to that. Um, we're going to have some pretty cool uh, breakdowns from Rylan talking about Kind of using his engineering mind and how he's applied that to the land business taking a data-centric approach to market selection to pricing uh, of course dennis yasko is going to be talking all things acquisition sales and negotiations michael michael bull is going to be talking about the transition that he made from wholesaling to land investing share the difference of uh, in, in the results that he's produced i think that's going to be more of like a motivational piece frankly you know mike was spinning his wheels for nearly three years in a wholesaling business he had this kind of impending date, uh, which was his, which was his his uh, marriage to his fiance, and he said, "I need to make a change. Like I'm just not bringing home the bacon." And so he pivoted into land. And I think, frankly, his story is really motivational. Um, we're gonna do a coach's hot seat, so a Q and A style coach's hot seat with all the Leah coaches. Essentially, what's gonna happen is people from the group will go and ask questions, and every person in the lineup on the coach's side will go and give their feedback to those questions. Um, I've got some really cool exercises that I'm doing through on vision casting, defining your dream dream life and how that uh, ties back into the KPIs of your business. Uh, I'm going to share a story that I've never shared before on the opening on Saturday, which frankly, I'm a little nervous to share, but I think I think it'll be impactful. Uh, and then Sunday, we've just got an absolute powerhouse of guest speakers. We've got Clint Turner coming on talking about the future of the land business, talking about how the industry is maturing and the steps we can uh, take to stay stay ahead of the curve and stay sharp. Uh, Ajay and Ben are gonna come on talking about balancing the visionary and integrator roles within the land business. So talking about partnership in a land business, talking about, you know, usually when we look at land investors, they kind of fall into two categories, right? I always joke, either you're really good at the sales and bad at the data or vice versa. And if you look at that in terms of like a persona, usually what that is, is you have a visionary and you have an integrator, right? 
I mean, typically a, a land investor is just one or the other. It's, there's essentially really no overlap there. And so whether you have a partner in your business or you're looking to hire, you need a counterbalance, right? You need to have that yin to your yang in your land business. And so RJ and Ben both were land investing independently for about a year and a half. And they were getting some results, but frankly, they were kind of spinning their wheels, right? And they combined forces and, and have just kind of gone parabolic, like a hockey stick up into the right. And it's because they found that really good balance for each other. Now, I'm one of those folks that says partnerships, let's stray away. I, I typically uh, advocate against partnerships, but I think when done correctly, um, you know, if we look at Ajay being worth one point and Ben being one, worth one point, when they come together, they're worth four points, right? The sum is greater than the parts. And I think that if you do partnerships right, that's the outcome. I've got Kyle Bryant coming on talking about launching a fund and exclusively going after value add deals. So how he's doing entitlement deals, subdivide deals, how he's actually partnering with sellers and keeping as little of his capital in, uh, into the deal. And so I think Kyle's one of those one of those few exceptions in the land business who's really said, like, how do we 10 X this, right? It's not about going and making a million or $2 million a year. Kyle's uh, maniacally uh, focused on doing really, really big deals, which I think most land investors, we get put into these boxes and we don't frankly think that big in most cases. And I think Kyle is a testament to thinking big in the land business. He was one of those guys that was doing essentially what we were doing for two years, the standard, you know, buy for 20, sell for 50 time kind of deals. And said, so, you know what, this is not the life I want to create. I want to go and do bigger, better, badder things in the land business. Uh, so he actually just launched his fund. So we're going to learn a lot about what that process actually looks like, right? I think a lot of people say, well, at some point I would love to have a fund to go and fund all my own deals. We're going to talk about the red tape and the complexity involved in terms of turning land into a security, which is what you're going to do when you actually go and create a fund. Um, we have a gentleman uh, named Mark Weiss who's coming on talking about buy and hold real estate. So talking about, hey, you've got this cash flowing land business. How do we actually go and build wealth, right? How do we take that money from your land business and go and park it into long term buy and hold real estate where we can depreciate that against our income? We can get some cash flow. And of course, we can get some appreciation uh, over the years. Uh, Dennis and myself are going to do a pretty cool breakdown on one of the, the interesting strategies that I'm using in my business right now to use acquisition interns and how I'm scaling my acquisition team without adding any more cost to our monthly payroll. It's something that a few other LIDA members have done that's just it just works like gang, gangbusters. And uh, Dennis is also going to talk about acquisition manager training. We got Sam Singh coming on talking about creative finance and how we can apply um, stuff that might be commonplace in the single family world or commercial world, but no one's really doing in land, right? I like to say that land investing is probably what wholesaling was in the 90s. You look at a lot of wholesalers today, they're really creative. Like they have multiple exit strategies. They know how to take down deals beyond just doing a, an assignment. And so I think if we can apply that same level to, uh, of creativity to our exit strategies, there's a lot of deals that we otherwise would just pass up on. Um, and so bringing someone in, one of my favorite ways to learn is by bringing people in that are in adjacent industries that we can go and mimic some of the stuff that's working uh, for them and bring it into our own world. And we're going to do something called a student hot seat. Uh, it's going to be a 10 minute per student breakdown of their business where we're going to do like a rapid fire coaching and try to diagnose where they're at, how they can get to where they're looking to go. Um, so that's just a high level outline. I don't want to <laughs> bore you guys with any more details. Suffice to say, it's going to be it's going to be pretty awesome. And I think beyond just the information, beyond just the education, really the camaraderie, right? Building connections, the land business. Ever since I got into this business, I've, I've thought this place is deprived of friendship, of camaraderie, of connection. Everyone's very siloed. You don't really have any peers that you can talk to talk about in terms of what you're doing in this business. No one really understands land. If you go talk to the lay person about land investing, it just goes right over their head, right? And so building those connections uh, can go a long way. And also what I've seen in terms of building your business, having these people that know you are the X, Y, and Z land investor. Nowadays, probably, I don't know, five or 10 times a week, I get people in my network that are sending me deals. And some of these deals have turned out to be really big for us. And that would only, that only happened because I put myself out there and I started making connections. And so I wanna foster that environment for everyone. Anyways, um, well, cool guys. I know that was, that was a lot. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, so before we dive into it here, let me, let me make sure this is being recorded. Okay, it is. 
Uh, can anyone give me some insight? Put it in the chat. If you guys are using Pebble, just put number one in the chat. Just so I know how many people on this call are actually using Pebble currently. All right. Uh, hold on. It looks like, <laughs> sorry guys, looks like we got some folks that are trying to join into the wrong call. This is posted on Google. So we had a little bit of confusion in terms of where the call is being hosted. All right. Okay, so we've got uh, a handful of folks here that are, are using Pebble. How long have you guys been using Pebble? Just put in the number of, of months or years. Just want to have some perspective on where the group's at. Transition. Okay, Chad, you're transitioning. Gage, two years, a month. Okay, okay. All right. Uh, looks like we just got the stragglers into the call too. So actually, I think that issue is on my end. So apologies, guys. Um, all right. Well, let me give you guys a little bit of perspective on my experience with Pebble. I'll talk about why we're making the transition. Uh, as you guys know, I've been banging the drum of Follow Up Boss for a long time. And frankly, Follow Up Boss is a great platform. I think they've really nailed down the communication side of things. Um, the truth is every platform has pros and cons, right? I think Pebble is still lacking a little bit in the communication department. But here's what I noticed. And anytime I see this in my business, I start to get upset and I start looking for solutions. When I look at different components of my business where I'm using six or seven different tools for one thing, that makes me mad, right? I wanna consolidate, I wanna make my business more efficient. So what I notice is we've had this platform, which is our CRM, which we are just using for communication. Then I've got like five other spreadsheets that track our KPIs. Then I've got this database built out in Google Drive. Then I have Trello that I'm using as a Kanban board. That's annoying, right? I look at Pebble and I say, they do all of that under one umbrella. When we look at what Pebble really is, it's a CRM, but really beyond that, it's also a database. And with that database aspect of things, they have all of our information in terms of tracking our KPIs. Now, I, I got approached by Jesse uh, fall of last year about joining onto Pebble. I said, no, I don't think Pebble's there yet. I, I, I see the vision, it's just not quite there. And he said, Summer, well, if you come and join Pebble, A, I can show you the roadmap of what we're working on, and B, we'll take your input and your group's input, and we'll actually put rubber to the road. We'll actually start putting that into the platform. And so I hemmed and I hawed, and, in the spring of this year, I said, you know what? All right, open me up an account. I'm going to start toying around with it. And that's where we find ourselves today. So obviously, you guys know we went through and added our own spin on, on the platform. Now, those are not really like the big changes, right? Like the actual uh, changing of the infrastructure or how the data is interpreted, that's obviously beyond the scope of the LIA build out. And that's the stuff that we've been giving them our feedback on. So one of the biggest things that I see with Pebble is that they have all of our data, right? Because they're a database and they're a CRM. They can spit out all of our, our KPIs at a click of a button. And this is work that I pay probably $150 a week for, for someone on my team to go and track all of our KPIs across, across the board, both communication KPIs, also just overall business KPIs. Um, and so that they've, they've taken that to heart. And we're going to talk about some of the changes that we've uh, kind of pushed upon them. We'll talk about that once we get into the platform. I'm also going to collect some of your guys' feedback. This call is recorded and we are going to share it. Uh, with, with the Pebble team. Um, one thing just for context as well, I don't know if anyone here has ever made the jump from one CRM to another. If you have, you know the pain that, that's associated with it. It's certainly not easy. And so the transition for us is like moving a big cruise ship, right? It takes a long time to turn that thing around. So the plan that we put into place is initially we said, well, let's just go and export all of our data from Follow Boss, go plug that into Pebble and we'll be off to the races. It's not quite that simple. And so we're doing this kind of slow graduation, a slow fade, where all of our new data and all of our new leads associated with that data are getting put into Pebble, but all of our old leads are still living in Follow Up Boss. And over the months and potentially even up to a year, that will kind of slowly start to phase out. We're most likely always going to have at least one parent account for Follow Up Boss, just to have access to all that information, to keep those phone numbers in place, um, but our actual team, Dispo, acquisitions, all the ancillary roles that sit underneath them will all be inside Pebble. So it hasn't been like an overnight switch for us. And I think just full discretion, 
I am by no means a Pebble expert, and we're going to talk about who is a Pebble expert and how you guys can get support on the more basic things. This is still very much a learning process for me as well. And so what I'm going to share with you guys today is how I'm using Pebble, what we built into Pebble, and I'll obviously go, we'll go through FAQs, but there very well may be some questions that go right over my head, right? In fact, I've actually had some students bring some things to me about Pebble that I didn't even know we had access to, right? And so when it talks about, when we're talking about Hey, Sumner, how do you go add a, a fourth email to the platform for your team? Some of that stuff's going to be outside of the scope of what I'm familiar with because all of our communication is still living in follow-up boss, at least for the time being. Um, I got another question for the group. I think most people here, probably the majority of people here are inside the 90-day challenge program or have access to it. Who's gone through and watched the training with Jesse inside that program? If you have, just say yes inside the chat. So Hal's watched it, okay. Anyone else? Okay, my homework assignment to you guys. So Hal watched it today. Looks like the most of you guys haven't watched it. My homework assignment to you guys today or this weekend is to go through and watch that. So really, really good, I think an hour and a half or two hour breakdown from Jesse himself to me and to Dennis and to Rob about how how to use pebble and just the best practices associated with pebble we also go through a pretty meaty faq section in there so i'm not going to repeat a lot of the information that's covered in that video uh, we also have a training from jesse inside leah as well so there's two kind of pillar pillar pieces of content that you guys can lean lean into um okay let's let's jump into it uh, again just just for context at the very top of this chat i put some of my favorite kind of resources from Pebble in terms of just general questions, right? So we're talking about like setting up lead forms, saving deals from an inbox, call recording, phone setup, email setup, all those FAQs are there. I've also got them pulled up here uh, on the computer so we can go through those if there's any questions uh, surrounding that. All right. Uh, before we dive into this too, does anyone have any questions about just the transition that we're making into Pebble? I reckon we're not the only one making a transition from fill in the blank CRM to Pebble. Do you guys have any questions on, on how we're doing that and best practices around that? No? Okay. All right. So let's take a look. Sumdra, if you don't mind, I had a, I had a quick question here. Yeah. In, is the 90 day um, program, is it inside the, the LEA program? Um, Accelerator program training course? So, so, yeah, so it's not inside the actual LIA course. So when you log into Teachable, now you'll see there's two views. There's access to the 90 Day Zero to Hero, and there's access to the LIA program. So you'll see there's actually two different courses you can plug into from like the, the top view of Teachable, but you won't find the modules stacked with the modules inside uh, the LIA course, if that makes sense. And if you have any questions about that specifically, if you want to send uh, Newman an email after this, he can send you a screenshot of just just how to how to find it or a video of how to find it but you'll find it on that same teachable login that you have you'll find it in there okay all right yeah. thank you cool um and actually again let me i'm going to ask one question for the chat just just out of curiosity who here i know you guys have already answered who's using pebble but who here is making the leap from one crm to pebble let me know i just want to get a little bit of context on who's making that that transition No one's making the transition? Someone's gotta be transitioning. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Jay says, we'd love to, but Pebble communications automation is lacking. Yep, 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 yep. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna go through, uh, first on the docket, I'm gonna talk about some of the uh, kind of big rocks that we've passed off to Jesse and his team in terms of improvements that we want to see. So when you guys log into Pebble, you'll see this dashboard here. They've actually just made some new updates so they have the statistics, which are just KPIs, and they actually have this new task set up here. This was not here. Uh, one of the issues that I found with Pebble, the pieces of feedback they would give to them, it's like we have someone trying to join. Sorry. Uh, one of the pieces that I, one of the pieces of feedback that I'd given to him, is that the tasks just get really jumbled up. It's really easy to start missing tasks. And in fact, I'm going to show you guys just what Follow Up Boss looks like from a task perspective. And this is really like what we use as a North Star for setting up this task breakdown. So if we go here to tasks, I can go and toggle for team members and see 
anyone that has follow up boss access, I can go see what their tasks are. Uh, we can look at overdue tasks. Um, for this person, there's a lot of overdue tasks. What you'll find is some of these people just, they do the task and they never check it off, right? And so that, that was one of the issues with the task setup is it was really difficult to see who was associated with that task, the due date for it, uh, and if it was actually getting done. So this is a new feature that they just added in uh, kind of per our, our feedback. So when we look at this statistics page here, um, this is like 25% of what it should be in terms of KPI tracking. So obviously you guys can see that, or Pebble can see the mail that's being sent, whether you're pushing through them or just uploading data on there, they can see uh, the new data that's being added into the platform. Again, whether you mail through them or not, they'll still have access to that information. They'll see out of that data set or those data sets, what's been actually moved into the deals category, right? Uh, the response rate, properties purchased, properties sold, net profit, average hold time. So this is where it gets a little bit funky. So uh, if you're a land investor, I think you'll, you'll pretty quickly understand like the simplest way or how most land investors do their accounting is let's say I sell four properties this month and my basis in those properties is $25,000 each. I sell them at $50,000. That means for that month, I would report $100,000 of gross profit. Even if I went and acquired half a million dollars of new acquisitions that month, I'm not gonna say I'm in the hole by 400 grand. Just not how most land investors do their accounting. That's partially too, because most people aren't self-funding those deals. It's just a really hard business to run that way. And so the way that this reports right now is it says, hey, if you go and purchase $500,000 of, of properties this month and sell 100,000, you're gonna be negative $400,000. That's just frankly silly, right? And so one of the, the, the features that they're adding is changing this. So it actually just calculates based off of the properties that sold this month, what was our basis in those properties? And then it'll spit out what our actual net profit was for the month or gross profit rather. Uh, you'll still see the total uh, dollar value for what's been purchased and for what's been sold. Um, we're gonna be adding in uh, a ROAS feature, so tracking return on, on ad spend uh, on a per uh, campaign basis county basis, and then holistically, whether it's for the month, the quarter, or the year. Again, all of this data lives in here, so it's relatively in, easy for them to generate those reports. Um, this revenue per month is gonna be hinged to this, this new gross profit calculation, so this will be much more accurate. Uh, the mailings per day, if you're mailing through here, you'll, you'll get access to that. Uh, otherwise, it's not really gonna be relevant for you. Um, and then a lot of the other uh, calculations that we track in terms of like, hey, if we're gonna go and sell, 10 properties this month and half of them sell on owner financing terms, I wanna see how much new recurring revenue was added to our business. Right now, they don't show anything to support that. In fact, they're still looking at the total finance price and applying that to the sold value. We do wanna look at that. We do wanna see, hey, this is how much new value we've added to our owner finance pipeline. So we wanna see that total amount, but we also wanna see that new recurring revenue that's been added in. Um, and a whole slew of other things, right? I think tracking our, our best counties in terms of like response rate, being able to actually drill this down to those different areas. Uh, same thing here, when we go look at this time function, the fact that we can only look at 30 days year to date and all time, frankly, is pretty silly. So Jay, to go back to what you're saying, yes, I think they actually, they definitely have some communication issues uh, in terms of the tools available with calling, texting, emailing, but also there's just a lot of low hanging fruit inside this platform that they're like, they're almost there. They're so close. They're like an inch away from the finish line. And I think part of what's happened is not to disparage anyone, but I think there's a lot of new land investors that use Pebble. And frankly, it's kind of who they've geared themselves to. And so I don't think they've ever really gotten feedback from folks that are doing this at an ultra, ultra high level. Now there are some big land investors that use Pebble, don't get me wrong, but it hasn't really been built out for someone that runs a high volume, high ticket, high margin, uh, business that's using outside capital, right? This is really built more like someone that's doing like a land geek model or what have you. And that's just not the direction that the land business is moving. So um, Jay, I do think communication issues are there. I also think that when it comes to stuff like this, there's just some silly problems that they need to get resolved. The truth is no platform is perfect, right? When I looked at Follow Up Boss, their communication was amazing. The tools were so good in there. Every call gets recorded. It's really, really cheap to set up in terms of communication. And frankly, the platform itself overall is slightly cheaper um, than Pebble as well. 
But the issue with that is like when we look at the organization side of things, the fact that we are using, you know, almost half a dozen different tools to do all the things that can be done in here is a real nuisance. And when you factor in the cost of those additional half dozen tools, quickly just to run like a, a quote unquote CRM by duct taping all the solutions together, we were paying way more than what we'd ever pay on Pebble. We were spending probably close to a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars a month just to duct tape all those tools together, which frankly is, is just annoying. Um, and then also like when we look at new land investors as well, I think the, the cardinal sin that I see repeated time and time again is new land investors don't track their KPIs. And that's a problem. Those KPIs need to be tracked. But part of the issue is they don't, the reason they don't get tracked is A, they're either too busy to do it, they don't want to do it, uh, and they don't know how to hire someone to come and input that information for them. And so a tool that has a database like this allows us to kind of remove that issue of trying to hire someone or doing it yourself. I can't tell, tell you guys how many people I know in the land business that are doing half a million plus a year who don't track their KPIs. And like the, 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 the glass ceiling that they're hitting is the fact that they have no uh, visibility in their business in terms of what's working and what they should double down on and what they need to remove. And so that's usually a, a pretty obvious bottle. Um, all right, so that's, that's some of the, the feature stuff that, we, that we're looking to add in. Now, obviously there's the communication side of things that we've all told Pebble time and time again in terms of what needs to be improved there. Um, and from what I've been given in terms of a timeline, it sounds like most of that stuff is set to fall within a 12 month period. Some a little bit sooner, sooner some a little bit later. Uh, one of the, the annoying pieces is that they don't have an iPhone app. You can go and save to your home screen on an iPhone or Android, the actual web browser, which does work on your phone. I pulled my team internally in our land business and this is about half their work or calls or texts or emails or what have you is getting done on their phone. So it's actually a pretty big pillar for us. You know, if you're creating the correct incentives for your team, they'll take calls on the weekends. They'll take calls at night because they have skin in the game and they want to make money. Um, and that's just a little bit funky with how it's set up right now too. So getting an iPhone app or an Android app uh, is going to be important for Pebble. Um, okay, so one, one last thing too I, I wanted to uh, tap into before we dive into the nitty gritty. If you guys go down here to, uh, well, looks like they might have changed actually. If we go over to just Pebble Knowledge Base. Um, looks like they might have, here we go. So they changed the layout actually uh, compared to how it looked earlier this week. So you guys will see all these different little buckets for using their platform. And they've got really, really clean articles built out on how to do just some of the more basic, tedious stuff, some of the stuff that's important. So you know, a lot of these questions reoccurring inside uh, Discord and elsewhere would really recommend plugging into their knowledge base. You guys can also go here and search. Um, if you guys get into any roadblocks, you're just like, I can't find the answer there. I need some support or I want to make a recommendation. If you guys send an email to, I believe it's hello at pebblerei.com, um, they'll get you guys set up. Now, I know for some uh, previous Pebble users that have wanted to plug into kind of the LIA uh, setup, they haven't known how to do that. So if you go and email hello at pebblerei.com, they'll actually go and manually input all of the, the changes that we've made into Pebble uh, for you guys, free of charge. Okay, so let's talk about the changes that we made to Pebble. Um, if we go here to this deal board section, so this is actually all different, which is interesting. So now you guys can add multiple boards. I know one of the, the areas they're adding here as well is a subdivision board. Value add deals are all the rage nowadays. Frankly, they're gonna get treated a lot different than like a standard seller deal. And so they're adding in this subdivision board that's gonna have stages that are bespoke to subdivides, right? That kind of the deal cycle is gonna be way, way different for these bigger value add deals. And frankly, the stages that we have set here for seller deals just really aren't applicable. I don't know if anyone's used Pebble in the last few days, but you guys will notice this is all entirely different. In fact, when I logged in here on Thursday, so yesterday, the view was entirely different. So they must've made some changes. You guys will see the design is a little bit different here. Um, so we go and look at the changes that we made to Pebble. So if you go and plug into Pebble, they have their stock and standard stages, which again, for a land geek business model, yeah, they make sense, they're good enough, but they're nowhere near uh, what we were actually using inside of Follow Up Boss. And so what we did is we came in for the seller deals, for the inventory, for the buyer deals, and went and created stages that are kind of true to our strategy, right? Our mid-market strategy is gonna have a totally different sales cycle and different process than going and flipping desert squares in Mojave County or what have you. 
we went and built out new stages and stages are important, but every stage is gonna have a set uh, list of tasks that go along with it. You guys have probably heard me say this little quip, which is every single land deal that comes into your business is gonna have a checklist of 40 or 50 items that need to get done on all sides of the spectrum, right? So on the acquisition side, on the operation side, which we would call inventory in this case, and on the disposition side, there's gonna be a set series of checklists that you have to go through. And if you're building this conveyor belt-esque business, and you're putting very similar assets onto the business, very similar subtypes of land, that checklist is really never gonna change. There's been a lot of ambiguity for newer land investors or for when you start hiring people of like, okay, deal is sitting in due diligence. What, what exactly do I need to do there? What does my team need to do there? And so we've taken really all the guesswork out of it. Um, now look, at there's still gonna be some oddities where, hey, there's another piece of due diligence that you need to go and check. For example, I had a, a really insightful call yesterday for an entitlement deal that we've been working on in Washington. If you guys have been around for a while, you guys have probably heard me talk about this deal. We put this property under contract at $185,000. There's commercial lots trading for 2 million to 3 million on the same street. It's 10 acres. A lot of those comps are 13 acres. Team and I thought, okay, we've absolutely hit the gold mine here, right? We went through our set stages of due diligence, just like anyone else would do the same checklist here. Um, and when we got to the the uh, flood zone stuff, we realized we're a little bit in over our head. And so we actually uh, paid for a call with an engineer that works with the county. Um, and they gave us a full deep dive on what we can and can't do, the different the differences between floodways, flood zones, wetlands, like all these different nuances. And so for like a bigger entitlement deal, uh, the due diligence process is going to look a little bit different. So this is this will flex and change a bit. And you guys are also aren't held hostage to this set series of checklists, right? You guys can make adjustments to those and you guys can also pass off feedback along to us as well. This is not the, the end all be all. And in fact, if you looked at our business over the last few years, we've gone through evolutions in terms of adjusting stages, in terms of adjusting tasks for each stage. And so this stuff is fluid. And as we go and make improvements in our own business, those improvements will be reflected in kind of this template that we built out for, for LEA members inside Pebble. Um, now, one thing that's interesting is because we use this kind of Kanban board strategy here, if we go and look at inside uh, Follow Up Boss, the way the stages work are, are actually totally different. They do have this deal section, which is essentially a Kanban board. It, it doesn't play out quite the same as what you'd see here in Pebble. But a lot of the staging that we've used in here was, was a lot more simple than what you're going to find inside Pebble. So we actually had to tweak and make some changes to make it actually make make sense for Pebble. Um, and so some of the stuff we actually became a little more uh, detail, detailed than what was existing inside Follow Up Boss. But for the most part, this is pretty much the same tried and true process that we've been using for a long time. Um, all right, so let's talk about, um, let's talk about that, let's talk about lead form. Before we go into the different stages, let's, let's go talk about um, communications and setting up lead form forms. I wanna make sure um we haven't made any yeah it looks like this is all the same okay so we go to this inbox section here i think a lot of people in this group use pat live or maybe you guys have a landing page um that you want to go and send sellers to or send buyers to one of the cool things is you guys can go and create these lead forms here now what we've done for a long time is we've again duct taped these bizarre solutions with like a google form that uh, zaps into our follow-up boss or what have you, this is all gonna be in one place. And so when you go and get a lead that fills out a form, whether it's from Pat Live or whatever platform you're using, it'll go and actually route directly into here, um, which is really helpful. You guys can also get the embed code and put this into a landing page. I think one of the lowest hanging fruits you guys can do, if you guys are sending out a decent volume of mail, you guys can also just make this a public form and you could even just send leads to this public form. One of the easiest things you guys can do, if you guys are sending a, a decent quantity of direct mail, let's say 5,000 pieces plus a month, you really need to be capturing leads at every stage of their own personal journey. So some sellers are going to want to call you, some are gonna handwrite you a letter, some are gonna text you, uh, and some want to go find you online. And so A, you should have a web presence, and that should include some level of social proof. But if you have a web presence, you also need a way to go and capture those leads. And so having a really simple landing page with a lead capture form is a good way to go and extract a few additional points of conversion to all the mailers you're sending out. And Pebble makes that really easy by building out these lead forms that will automatically input uh, into the CRM. 
I don't know if you guys are like me, but I am absolutely technologically challenged. And so in the past, I've always just paid people to do things like this, but you just get this all in one right here. So the way we're using that is a lead form for Pat Live. So you don't have to use a Google form anymore, uh, as well as putting it onto landing pages. Um, so yeah, meet the lead where they're at, right? Some people are gonna wanna call you, some people are gonna wanna go to your website. You guys can do the same thing on the Dispo side of things as well. And so creating these lead forms on your Dispo website, you guys can have that implemented there. We found the same thing, right? With buyers, some of them get, get in contact with us in the weirdest fashion. Some people find me on Instagram and send me a DM and say, hey, we wanna buy this 40 acre property and fill in the blank county. Um, and so being, being able to actually capture the lead information is really important. Once you guys start paying big money, right, on land.com and Landflip, these really expensive land listing sites. Really the goal on those websites is to have a call to action that drives someone to a website and then capture the lead form on the website, or you can capture their lead information on the actual original site. But a lot of people, what we found happening is that they go uh, from land.com, let's say hypothetically, they go over to our website, they call us on our website, and we just get their phone number. Uh, opposed to going and putting this lead form, we can go and capture all their information. A big chunk of our sales every single month comes with an existing database of buyers that we have in our CRM. You guys need to be collecting that information. That is a defensible moat that, frankly, people can't compete with. If you own that lead's information, you can just remarket, 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 remarket to them. I've always said as the land business gets a little more complex, as the, the ocean gets less blue, if you will, and there's a little more competition out there, which in the grand scheme of things, it's still very, very little competition. Um, we need we need some kind of defensible moat. And a lot of times we look at that defensible moat, if you will, it's really on the disposition side, right? Acquisitions at a certain point will become more complex and become a little more saturated and marketing channels will die off and new ones will come into, into vogue. But where we felt the competition the most is on dispositions. And so if we're going and fighting for listing spots on land.com, it gets really, really expensive. When I first joined land.com, however many years ago, three years ago, three and a half years ago, I think we were paying $400 a month. And now we pay close to $3,000 a month. And our results are not a whole lot different, right? Those platforms are gonna continue to get it more competitive and get more expensive. So owning that leads information, being able to remarket to them is such an easy uh, value add in your business, just frankly a no brainer. So I recommend everyone use these lead forms, both on the disco side, both on the acquisition side. Uh, if you guys see me looking over here, I just got some notes. I wanna make sure that I keep a clean train of thought. Um, one thing too that I wanna throw on there, can you guys let me know in the chat, who here has ever heard of the Pebble Pricer? Anyone ever heard of this? Let me know in the chat. I don't hear anyone talking about this. And yeah, Andy says he uses it constantly. That's why he's doing 30K a month like clockwork. Amy says she saw it. Uh, Aim says, yes, he uses it. So I'm gonna pull this up for you guys. I'm, I'll put this in the chat. I think this is something that frankly, uh, yeah, Vernon says yes, but lacking. Frankly, Pebble should be really beating this drum and sharing this with the world. So I think it's one of the coolest things I've ever put out. So we're just gonna go Pebble, Pricer, uh, Google Chrome. So the Google Chrome extension, it's totally free. You actually don't even have to be a Pebble user to use this. And so essentially what you can do is you can go over to a land watch or fill in the blank website and it'll go and generate all the pricing information on that page. And so you can go and figure out median price points, you can figure out average price points uh, and it just makes the pricing process a whole lot easier. Now it's not a one-stop shop for all your pricing needs, but this is a no brainer to add into your guys' business. So I'm gonna share this inside the chat. Again, I think this is one of the coolest things I've ever released. I, frankly, they should be charging for this. It's just a, a really, really valuable platform. Um, okay. Let's go over to these deal boards. Uh, and again, now you guys have more customization in terms of being able to create multiple deal boards. And so if you looked at our business and you said, Sumner, how would you use these multiple deal boards? Well, if we look at our land business, now there's really kind of three divisions to it, right? There's our super low ticket, low intrinsic value owner finance model. There's our mid ticket cash flip model and some owner financing. And now there's our subdivided value add model. I would probably build out boards that are bespoke to each one of those divisions, mainly on the acquisition side. Frankly, the Dispo side is gonna be pretty much same, same across the board. Um, but on the acquisition side, that process is gonna to look totally different. And so I would build out stages that are bespoke to that. And I might be saying something, what would those stages look like? Well, if we look at like doing those smaller owner finance deals, in most cases we're self-closing. In most cases, the due diligence is a lot simpler. In most cases, the sales cycle is maybe two weeks. 
I mean, you get a lead in is pretty quickly a yes or a no in terms of the deal is going to get done. But they're going to have less staging in terms of where the seller is at. Uh, we're going to have some kind of tracking in terms of tracking those self closings. The mid market strategy, we've already got that built out in the seller deal boards here. And then for the subdivide, it's going to be a much longer um, cycle. And it's going to be a much, the, the, the staging is going to be a lot more uh, kind of one step, one step, one step at a time, very slow. Like when we go and make that first offer, it might be a lot deeper into conversations with those sellers. And so we're going to extend that timeline and, and they're going to extend it too. I mean, frankly, working with these sellers is a, is a slow going process. And so the staging is going to look a whole lot different. So a lot of the stuff that we're showing here today is really based off of the mid-market strategy, which I think nowadays pretty much everyone here is using. Uh, the inventory, the buyer deals, that's not really going to change a whole lot. Potentially, you could change some of the inventory stuff uh, based off if it's going with, like, with a realtor or it's going to be sold internally. But frankly, I don't think there's too many differences there. So let's go crack into the seller deal stages here. Uh, this is just a dummy account that we have. And so we've just got some, some dummy deals in here. Some of these, some of this data actually is our data that we've put in. Um, but I'm going to go through and run you guys through the thought process behind these stages and why they're relevant and why they have to get done uh, when you guys get new leads in. Okay, so we're gonna look at the seller inquiry stage, right? So when, when a new lead comes in, as your business grows, you guys are gonna have multiple channels for, for getting leads. And frankly, even if you're just using direct mail, that lead is gonna come from different, um, like different communication platforms, right? So do they come from a website? Do they come from text? Do they come from email? I wanna track all that stuff and I wanna see what, what's really bringing home the bacon, right? But then again, as you guys start adding like cold calling and cold texting, we wanna know the lead source. We want to add the inquiry communications to the record. We want to add property details, add offer price, send intro, email, and text. Okay. Um, the property details is actually a report that we generate generate inside Data Tree. So there's going to be some attachments that we include for every lead that comes in. This is the report that we pull on properties. So if we come here, oops, let's just go and let's go and pull up a random property here. Uh, let's grab a lead. Hold on. Okay, there's a property in Costilla County. So what we're gonna do is when we get that lead in, we're gonna come over to Data Tree or whatever your preferred platform is for mapping and pulling up properties. We're gonna go and grab this property detail report here. We'll download that, we'll add that as an attachment. Um, we're going to go and take a screenshot of the property. We're going to get a 3D aerial map. We'll talk about that in the next stage here. Um, one of the things that I think is just really low hanging fruit, you guys will see when we go and get a new lead, and this is actually kind of interesting. This is a seller that came to us through Landflip, which is uh, a bizarre way to get a hold of us. Uh, let me go and get rid of these here. I'm going to show you guys what we do. Um, okay, so here's a lead from Launch Control, right? I think this lead came in 11.33 a.m. today. Anytime we get a lead from any platform, whether it's Pat Live, it's Launch Control, we always need to include that initial conversation, whether it's what they passed off to Pat Live or what if, if it was in the, the text thread, that needs to get imported into the record. Now, that might not seem relevant when you're a solo operator, but as your team size grows, having full transparency in terms of what's going on at every step of the journey is really, really important. And when we go and have our first call or maybe our second call when we're making an offer, a lot of the stuff that we learn inside these threads is going to dictate how we actually carry on that conversation. Let me just give you guys a quick example. You're going to see this guy, Bobby, here. Look at Bobby. Third oh, let me let this person in. Sorry, guys. Sorry about that. Uh, let's look at Bobby's third text. Bobby says, hello. <laughs> he says, I need a million dollars ASAP. Thanks for your time. I think Bobby was being facetious. So that him being facetious is worth noting, right? We know this guy's most likely a tire kicker, but let's say he put a legitimate number in there. That ASAP shows us, hey, there's real intent there. There might be some level of urgency here. And so that's just gonna be these little nuggets, these little bread cup crumbs that are gonna dictate how we speak to that seller and how aggressive we are with putting our offer together, right? One of the things that is just like the, the, the rookie mistake in land is making offers based off of the property. Right, we have to have some idea what the property is worth and what we want to offer for it. Like, yeah, you definitely need to know that information. But the best offers are built around the seller's needs. 
every seller that reaches out to us, irregardless of the platform, they're coming to us from an unsolicited text message, cold call, email, letter. Not a lot of people do that, right? If I go send out 10,000 letters, maybe 70 people reach out to me. That little cohort of 70 people, they've got something going on in their life. There's a problem. Now it might not be, hey, the sky is falling. Like if you go into single family real estate, you'll see a lot of times the the problem is a big problem. Like they've got some impending lawsuit or some crisis is happening in their life. Land, I don't see that there's as much uh, distress with these sellers, but there's still some kind of problem going on. That's why they reached out to this bizarre letter and came inbound to us or whatever the, the mode of communicating was. So what we need to do is we need to fact find and figure out what that problem is how serious it is, how urgent it is, and what dollar amount would solve that problem for them. And building out offers based off of their problems is always, almost always, gonna create a better experience for the seller, right? We are here to serve them, we can't forget that. But it's simply gonna give you a better price on the property. I, I can't tell you how many deals have come our way where it's on paper, it's a buy for 50, sell for 100, but we fact find, right? That's why on that first call, we're not just going and throwing out an offer, we're fact finding, and we're crafting an offer for that second call. And in that example, we might find out that the seller needs $30,000 for whatever reason. Cool, let's solve that problem and build an offer based off of their problem, not based off of the property. We just added $20,000 to our bottom line. Now, not every seller is gonna put all their cards on, their on the table, right? Not everyone's just gonna tell you their life's problems. And so a lot of times it's taking these breadcrumbs from different areas and putting them all together. And so as your team grows, the likelihood of your acquisition manager logging into launch control and going and looking at the conversation is pretty much zero. And then bothering your texting manager to go find that information is also, while they might do it, it just creates friction in your business and it's unnecessary. So all of that initial communication needs to get added in to the lead record. Um, I don't know why more people don't do this, frankly. <laughs> it's just the, the lowest hanging fruit out there. Um, okay. so. You're going to send that intro email and text. You guys are going to add an offer price. And really, this is going to be an offer range. All of this is going to be baked into this note section here. This is going to be your first batch of notes that are going to go in. So if we go and look at, we'll just use Bobby as an example. We're going to say uh, source LC. That's going to be launch control. Inquiry. We're going to come in. And imagine we're just taking this from launch control. We're just gonna copy and paste this in. We download this property detail report and add it in, which I'll just download this one, even though it's not the same property, just for examples. Okay. So, uh, this is a little bit different because it is a text. Now you might be thinking something or you say add offer price. That's not actually going through and creating our offer for the seller. That's adding what was the offer price that was put into the letter, the text, whatever it may be. And so I wanna know what, what did we anchor them on initially? So if you can see here, we told Bobby it'd be between 44,000, call it 64,000, okay? So this is gonna be the offer price. Are we gonna do the deal at that price? Yeah, probably not, but we need, to, we need to add that in. And we're gonna go and send our intro email and text. So we're gonna go and save this. And you guys will see once we move to different stages, you guys will add new notes and these will all kind of stack on top of each other, okay? Um, one thing that's important is adding the property. So you'll see that we've got this, this deal in the seller stage. We also need to link this to the database. So you guys actually need to go and add the property. And so the process with Pebble, it's a little bit different if you guys are familiar with different, uh, uh, CRMs, but the first step in our journey is actually adding the data in, going and doing our marketing, mailing, texting, whatever it may be, and then adding in that new deal and then linking it to that property record. So you can see we've selected this property record here for Paul and Deborah Apple. <laughs> it's a great last name. So you guys do need to link those together. Okay, let's go back to the seller deal section here. Uh, so you'll see this due diligence phase. So as you guys move down the conveyor belt, right? You wanna think about this all as one big assembly line. You guys are gonna come and slot this down. And you guys will see here, we've got new due diligence tasks that have been added. And so for you or for your team, these all need to get checked off and get moved on to. And you will see one of the things I did wrong here, I didn't actually go and check these off. We do need to check these off. I'm gonna show you guys a, kind of a pre-prepped due diligence 
uh, set up for a property here, okay? Let's just go through and talk about what's in the due diligence section. Now there's a little bit of weird overlap. You'll see here, they have some of these due diligence uh, fields that you guys can add in here. They cover some of the stuff we need, not all the stuff we need, okay? We'll talk about that though in a second. So for our due diligence, we need to confirm title vesting status, confirm if sellers on deed, five sold comps, five on market. I'll make sure someone's not trying to join. Okay, sorry, that was just a message. Um, add five sold comps, add five on market comps. For us internally, that's always been our rule, right? I think five on both sides is usually a, a good enough sample size to give us a pretty good read on values. Uh, one thing that I want to throw on there, because I can't stress this enough, in fact, I was just talking about this earlier today, how we comp properties is not the same process in terms of how we determine offer prices for a campaign. Two totally different things. If we're going and creating offer prices, let's say we're mailing to Freak County, Oklahoma, and we're doing the 10 to 20 acres. Well, we might go download all of the data for the county and go figure out what the median is, or what the average is, and see that low to high difference for the different prices. We'll go and start to formulate some offers based off of that. Now, those offers are not bespoke to any one property. We're making generalizations across the board. But when you guys get a lead in your guys' pipeline, you're not going to go and look at that same math in terms of what you created those initial offers for. Right now, we actually need to create a bespoke offer to this property. And so the framework that I've used from day one that's pretty much ne never led me astray is when we look at the order of importance for creating comps, it's proximity, it's fe features, and it's recency, okay? Proximity means the comp that we're looking at, how close is it to the subject property? The closer it is, in my book, the more relevant it is. Real estate in any, in any vertical is always a local game, whether it's land, houses, whatever it may be. We're buying land sight unseen in counties that we've probably never been to and probably will never go to, frankly. And so values can shift radically from one part of a subdivision to another or five miles away, it can be the hood and people don't wanna own land there or whatever it may be. Those are some of the more nuances that are hard for us to know. And so the only way that we can kind of circumvent that is by ensuring that we're looking at comps that are close to the property. And in most cases, if we are checking off that proximity box, by virtue of that, we're typically checking off the features box. Properties that are close by typically are gonna have the similar features. And when we look at features, we're talking about the setup of the property, right? Okay, so it rolls to the east and it's got some slope to it and it's got trees on it, it's got a river on it and it's five acres. Okay, well, ideally I wanna find properties that are kind of in that same little box as, as ours. It's rare that you're gonna find carbon copy properties that are perfect carryover, um, but it's important, right? We're gonna to try to make sure we check off all those boxes. And again, if we're finding comps that are close by, usually they're gonna have a lot of the same features. And the last point is recency. So a comp that's a day old, obviously is more relevant than a comp from a year ago. And so making sure that we're looking at data that's ideally as fresh as, as possibly can be. If you guys want to tack on one additional little nugget there, this is a bit ninja, but I also want to go look at the story of that comp. So if we're talking about the five sold comps, it's one thing to say this property sold a month ago. It's another thing to go and say, what was the story here? Well, it sold a month ago, but it was on market for a year, right? And they price dropped over and over and over and over and over again. Okay, that tells us something. We're probably not in the business of trying to sell our properties in a year, <laughs> you know? And so maybe it's a problem with the property, but more than likely there's a problem with pricing or something along those lines, or maybe it's just a demand problem in the market. And so I definitely want to go see what was that backstory with the comp. Same thing for those five on market comps. When I'm looking at what's on market, am I pulling an on market comp that's been up for 3000 days, or is it a fresh comp that's been up for 30 days? That's really important to note as well. Like, frankly, I will put no weight on a comp that's been up for over a year. If it's on market, it's been up for over a year, pretty much irrelevant. Uh, so it's important if you guys want to get a little more granular looking in the weeds there. Uh, we're going to add one image of the lot, just a 2D image of the lot. Now, this can be a bit irrelevant now that they do have mapping features inside um, Pebble, which is pretty cool. It plugs into the GIS maps. I frankly, I still do it. I want to make sure that A, sometimes there can be a weird disconnect between mapping properties. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this. You pull up a property on data tree, you pull up on map right, you're looking at two different properties. You're like, what the heck? I think when it comes to any of these mapping platforms, it's a, it's a trust but verify type thing. And so I want to I want to get as many reference points in terms of, okay, are we looking at the right property? You also see sometimes maps just map different. Right, and just you're like this. This looks different on these different platforms. We're gonna to want to add one 3D image of the lot. Determine legal access. Determine physical access. Determine topography, flood zone, wetlands, zoning, utilities, HOA, POA, 
delinquent taxes or delinquent HOPOA dues, assess value, confirm acreage, check last sale date and price. Anyone have any questions on what we just went through from the due diligence perspective? I'm gonna go take a quick look here in the chat and just go through any of these questions uh, before I move on. Um, all right. Uh, so Andy says you should ask them to make the task collapsible once the deal moves to a new stage. Um, I, let's see, that's a good point. I, yeah, I don't think you can make them collapsible. Uh, yeah, that's a good that's a good point, Andy. It, it does the view does start to get a little bit crowded. Um, Andy, if they could add an export to CSV function, it would be almost perfect for me. Yeah, I hear a lot of things like that where it's like so close, it would be perfect. They could do X, Y, and Z. Um, okay, yeah, it looks like it's uh, all pretty similar feedback here. Uh, just out of curiosity, one question for the group: for the folks that are using Pebble, who is using the Leah variant of Pebble? Ben's getting it set up now. Ames, you got a question? No, I was raising my hand saying that I use your version. Oh, okay, cool. I don't know why it shows up as Ames on here. I was like, I think that's Amy. Yeah, it's Amy. Um, is that your nickname? A woman of many names. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ames is a cute name. I like it. Um, so Amy getting it set up. Vernon, I like to play with it before I set it up. Yeah, Vernon, I think... Um, I mean, hopefully today we'll kind of give you some insight in terms of playing with it. I'm pretty sure if you ask Pebble, they can pop it in for you. And if you say, this ain't for me, I'm pretty sure they can just remove it. Um, or you can just make it a little more bespoke to you. Um, okay, so it looks like a few folks here in the group are using it. Okay, all right, let's pop back into it. And let me share my screen here. I don't wanna to get too excited. Okay, so a couple of things that I wanna throw on here just in terms of the due diligence tasks, just to make sure that there's clarity. Um, when we talk about determining legal access and determining physical access, and really some of these due diligence points, what we're most likely not talking about is going and calling the county and like validating it perfectly, right? Cause we like, time is of the essence. We still wanna get on the horn with a seller. Um, but I do think it's important that we at least get a pulse on what's going on there. So for example, I just did a, a call on Wednesday that I think was pretty insightful. I was training an acquisition manager and we found a property that looked like it was like 30 feet set back from a road, okay? He says, hey, this thing's landlocked. I said, well, hold on a minute here. To me, this looks like it's in a subdivision. I said, go check the legal description. He goes and pulls up the legal description. And I say, what's it, what's it say? It says subdivision, uh, Colo, Colo, Florida Acres or something, somewhere out in Colorado. Um, I said, this is in a subdivision. I find it hard to believe that people are buying land left and right in the subdivision. A lot of those properties look the same. They don't actually run up to a road. I find it hard to believe the subdivision would just create all these landlocked lots. I'm going to make an assumption here. I'm going to say they probably all have boundary easements or something along those lines. Created by the developer. And I got to let someone in. Um, so in that example, I said, let's go mark that as legal access, yes. We'll put in an asterisk that we need to verify, right? So a lot of times we're just doing like a little bit of like, okay, thinking through some of the logic. We're not gonna have the exact answer in the, the, the here and now, but we might add a, an additional task or an asterisk when we go and add that legal access breakdown for us to come back and actually verify with the county. Now, determining physical access is a little more nuanced. Uh, let's just go over here to data trees, look at this property here. Okay, so this property, you see dirt road, Right, so right off the bat, you say, okay, this is a dirt road, most likely a county road. Uh, dirt roads aren't always bad. Like some dirt roads are definitely better than, than others. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is like, how far is this from a paved road though? So we've got this one, which is also a dirt road. Let's just start peeling around here. And it looks like the 159 might be our closest paved road. And then I start thinking, okay, well, what's the climate out here? This is in Colorado, so I would say it definitely gets snow in the winters. I don't know the elevation. You could look that up. Maybe it's, I don't know, 6,000 feet in elevation in a valley. You got people that keep on joining. Sorry, guys. I don't know why it makes me actually physically admit them. Um, okay, so this looks like it's in a valley. Right? We've got this mountain, mountain range here, mountain range over there. 
So what I would do is I would go and grab, like if you're on MapRite, you can do like the little distance tool for use Google Earth. I would go and say, how far is this from a paved road? And try to just draw a quick assumption on seasonality. And I might say, okay, this is probably gonna be pretty easy to access the majority of the road of the year. Might be a little tough for a few weeks out of the winter. I don't think it's that big of a deal. There's actually, there's a paved road too up here, 142. Um, now, if I was looking at a property, let's say way back yonder in the mountains, and it was same distance, maybe 10 miles from a road or what have you, it's paved. My, my assumption there is like, okay, the physical access is probably gonna be like a five out of 10. Like it's accessible, but most times during the year, probably is gonna be pretty hard to get to when you're in like the fall, winter and spring, right? Uh, the other thing that I look at for physical access is I'm gonna go look at the topography. So are we talking about a road that's super steep? Or are we talking about a road, oops, what happened here? So my map got super zoomed in. Uh, anyways, we're talking about a road that is uh, super steep. Is it a decline? Is it an incline? Just trying to understand what the topography is, is gonna be an important factor that we add into uh, physical access. Now, this is certainly not like the perfect science for determining physical access. At the end of the day, the best way to know is just to send someone out there, right? I'll also, if I can, I'll drop a pin on the closest road on Google Earth or here in Data Tree. And that will allow me to kind of spin around and get a view uh, of the properties out there. Another thing that you can tack on is going and looking at any of the adjacent properties. Are they developed? What that tells me is, A, there's going to be some level of traffic on this road, which probably means someone's upkeeping it. Um, and other people are doing it. So, you know, why couldn't we do it? If there's no development in the case of this property, I'm going to start scratching my head and say, I don't know about the physical access. I had a conversation with Kirsten yesterday inside Discord about the two biggest causes of the deals that have gone sideways on us, right? You stay in this business long enough, you're going to have deals that do you dirty. <laughs> just, just going to happen. Truth is, the cards are still stacked in your favor. They're really not that bad when they happen. We had two deals last year that kind of gave us a run for our money. One that we thought we we're going to make 60 grand on and we made like 10 grand on and one that we're still holding. And we're probably going to take like a $2,000 loss on. Uh, Kirsten had a little, little bit of a bigger uh, loss there, but I think they'll recover from it. But the two things that have really killed the deals for me, if I go look back on it, flood zones, wetlands, not understanding what you can and can't do with them or how severe they are. So just kind of glazing over that and just doing a quick FEMA search and be like, oh, good enough, 100 year flood zone uh, and topography. And topography is gonna relate to the physical access, right? And so I really can't stress enough the importance of going and actually not only evaluating legal access, but physical access as well. Same thing too, if we're talking about that initial property in Florida Colo Acres, hey, this has got a boundary easement, but there's no road leading to the property. So there's like 20 feet or so of bushwhacking to get to the property. That's gonna really hinder the physical access. And so physical access obviously ties into the topography to some extent, but I cannot stress how important it is. It is a deal make or break for us. Even if the math pencils beautifully, we've just learned to turn away from those properties. Uh, determine flood zones and wetlands. Again, this ties into what I was just talking about there. What I learned on my call yesterday with this engineer, which ran for a little over an hour, is I know literally nothing about flood zones and wetlands. They are so complex. You could spend your whole life studying these things. I think a lot of us in this land business just take a quick glance and we kind of move on. Um, really, that's what we're going to do here in this case, right? This is not going to be our deep dive on flood zones. But I'm going to say, hey, if it's in a flood zone, what kind of flood zone is it in? Uh, we'll go and notate that here inside uh, the, the note section. So you guys will go see how we went and broke down some of these notes. Uh, when we go and add comps, we're always gonna go and add the actual comp link. Really with all this stuff, with the note taking, with the adding of this information, what we're optimizing for here is transparency across the board for our team, right? So I might have an intake manager that goes and puts this information in for our acquisition manager. And they go and look at this and I'm like, I don't know if this makes sense. And so they're gonna actually go and look at that comp. They're gonna dive deeper. And so you wanna make sure that it's all plug and play for everyone on your team tap into. Anyone have any questions on the due diligence section here? No? Okay. Okay, well, I'm not going to bore you guys with every stage in every category. Now we're going to zoom out a little bit. And we're going to start talking about or every task in every category. Now we're going to start talking about some of these stages, okay? Initial call. Right? That's going to be our first touch with the seller. Our first touch with the seller is not when we go and make an offer, unless they really beat us up for it, right? There's confusion here for a lot of land investors. I've listened to hundreds of calls with land investors or acquisition managers. A lot of times that first call is get on, 
make really weird small talk for five minutes and then just throw out an offer to them and get get on with it, right? That first call is our fact finding call. I think a lot of people have confusion on how we, we handle these calls, if we use scripts or don't use scripts. We typically don't use scripts. Um, I think people can feel that. A lot of what we do on these initial calls is we just ask softball questions. And you'll see that these questions open up the seller, they get them talking, and they drop little clues. And those little clues we're gonna use as firepower in all of our future conversations with the seller. Um, and you can also use those little breadcrumbs they, they drop to open up more conversations and more ask more questions. Someone that really just does this perfectly is if you listen to any call with Dennis, he goes in there, he's cool, calm, and collected, he asks questions about the property, they say these little nuggets, and he asks questions about that. And he fast forward 10 minutes into the conversation, he's talking about taking them out to lunch and when he went and vacationed at fill in the blank county and they're just having a merry old time. They rarely ever talk about price in those calls. And really what we're building up to in that first conversation is trying to figure out why the heck are they on the phone with us, right? Why do they take time out of their day to reach out to us and using that as firepower to, to, to continue getting in touch with them uh, or for building out an offer. Uh, if we look at this 14 day cadence here, what exactly is this? <laughs> well, if anyone here has been sending mail for, I don't know, a couple months, you'll quickly realize that if in that example, sending out 10,000 mailers, we get 70 people that reach out to us. There'll be a certain subset of those leads that reach out to us that we can't get a hold of, at least not initially. And so we run them through this 14 day cadence. You guys will see that cadence listed inside Leah under the attachment section. It shows what we do for each day. It's a 14 business day cadence. We don't do this on the weekends. And really what we're trying to do is just engage them, activate them, and get, get them to actually get on the horn with us. And then we can start moving them through this cadence again, or the rest of the cadence. If I look into most land investors CRMs, this is usually what it looks like. Lead fills out or calls Pat live, form gets added, they do a quick kind of cursory due diligence. They call them, they'll get a hold of them. They call them the next day, don't get a hold of them. They send them like a breakup text and email, hey, I've been trying to get a hold of you. If you want to sell, call me. And then that's it. We've added so much to our bottom line just by really working these leads, whether we get a hold of them initially or not. All right now, here's the caveat to this. You guys have heard me talk about chasing leads versus chasing deals. If if the property is objectively a bad property, and we know that just from our first pass on due diligence, no need to add them into the 14-day cadence. Right? We can go add that to the bad property section. Okay. So we don't want to waste time on deals that are, are frankly just going to be a bad fit. I see this happening time and time again, where like the lead uh, expresses a lot of intent when they talk to Pat live. The property is subpar or bad. And yet, because there's the warm and fuzzies there, people are spending all their time chasing them down. So we still have to use our discretion in terms of saying, is this a property that we actually want to add into our inventory? If not, let's slot to the end. Let's move into that bad property section. As a solo operator, or even as someone as a, with a small team, like where you spend your time is the make or break. The biggest thing that I'm always roping in on my acquisition team is teaching them how to discern where they should be spending their time and where they need to just wash their hands of it and move on. I think it's like the single greatest kind of make or break for a good acquisition manager is if they can go into the CRM, they can see a pipeline of 100 leads and they can suss out, hey, these five, they're getting all my energy and attention because A, they're close to the finish line, but more importantly, they're actually a property we want in our inventory. And so you have to be really critical about moving people out of this cadence if they're just frankly not a good fit. And then the rest of them are relatively explanatory, right? I think this is an interesting breakdown here. You'll see that there's a, a huge disconnect between sending a purchase agreement and getting a purchase agreement signed. And so for us, depending on the month, half, I mean, last month, probably half of the purchase agreements we sent actually got signed. On a good month, it might be 70%. Um, and so just because that purchase agreement is sent doesn't mean our work is done there. And so having your team being able to come in here and say, hey, we've got 10 pending purchase agreements right now. All right, we're really close to the money there. So let's go and spend our time, our energy and attention. And those deals have already met all of our criteria here, right? They've already checked all those boxes there. So the idea of going and spending time here versus going and spending time on a hot lead is obvious. The time has got to be here. And yet, this goes back to what I was saying with acquisition managers knowing how to spend their time. This is the thing that I am constantly harping on my team on. It, 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 it never ends. But if you can create a way to give visibility and to show them in, in plain English and to visualize it, hey, this is, this is where your time needs to go, usually makes it a little bit easier. Frankly, you're still going to have to manage them on this, though. Um, this deal funding stage here. So 
if you guys are using a joint venture funder or you guys are kind of raising private money for yourself, you'll notice that there is a process for deal funding as well. It's not as easy as just send it off to title and someone wires in the money. If you have your own private money, there's like a little bit of investor relations work in terms of maybe sending out the deal in the newsletter. Uh, if it's going and using a joint venture funder, filling out their form and submitting it to them. And so you also want to know what's the stuff that's pending with these deal funders. The truth is just like with title companies, you, it's like herding cats, right? You got to stay on top of them to make sure they give you a prompt response. A lot of these deal funders are just drowning in leads. And so knowing that, hey, we've got these five deals sitting in that deal funding stage and three have been accepted and two we've got no answer on, that's a problem and we need to follow up with them. Um, renegotiation, that's obvious, dead lead. That's just a lead that's fallen out of that 14 day cadence. They never made it, They never, we never got in touch with them there. Guys put them through like an automated drip campaign, text, email, still didn't get anything, you can move them to that dead lead category. Um, the, the process for us, and I've split tested this a lot of different ways. I think a lot of land investors, they get a lead that comes in, they wanna put them on some kind of drip campaign to let the automation do the heavy lifting. I found that the response rates are just abysmal there. They're really, really low. And frankly, I think it's kind of off-putting for sellers. And as you go after higher value leads, having that bespoke touch is really the difference maker, right? We're typically not the only one reaching out to these sellers. And so having that 14 day cadence where it's all manual touches goes a long way. Now you guys can use templates that you go and kind of craft to make it bespoke to them. But if we follow that 14 day cadence, we haven't got a hold of them. You guys can add them to drip campaigns, uh, which are, I don't know if anyone here is having success with drip campaigns. Our response rates are very, very, very low with drip campaigns. Uh, they tend just to not be very effective. Uh, anyone have questions here? Yeah, hey, Sumner, this is Jay, I do. Okay, what's up, Jay? So uh, just with what you just uh, described there with in terms of like uh, a drip campaign via text message, did you were you having the bad results because you didn't have the capability to like uh, uh, merge contact info into the text campaigns? No, so uh, what we did initially, so when we first started doing drip campaigns, we were just doing them right out of follow-up boss. So follow up boss would allow us to do one drip text and then you could just drip as many emails as you want. And obviously you can use merge fields and all that stuff. Uh, text is obviously the response rate is way higher than email and there's just rules and, and follow up boss in terms of what we could and couldn't do. So we started doing drip text through Twilio and we, we could merge that information in. Um, and like our response rate was way, 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 way higher with drip text, like substantially higher than, than cold email. Uh, but it still just wasn't super effective for us. But with any of those automations, you can always merge them in if it's inside the platform or with Twilio or whatever platform you're using. Okay. Yeah. I just think that like in a lot of cases, when we look at how those messages might go out to the seller, the problem, with, I mean, again, someone that's more tech savvy to me might be able to solve for this and it probably wouldn't be that difficult. But like, think about the difference of, of these two messages, right? Let's say it's a text. So if we send out a, a, a standard drip text, it might say, hey, Caroline, just following up on your 20 acre in Hampshire County, West Virginia, are you still interested in getting an offer? Okay, it's decent. You know, we made it somewhat custom to them. But let's look at that second example. Caroline filled out a lead form and she says, hey, um, I don't know, my, my kid needs money for college. Cool, that's a nugget. That's super relevant to the seller. It shows the seller we're paying attention and we're here to solve their problem. That message where we include that information hits way different. And so you could probably add that into like a, some kind of custom merge. Uh, I just think it might be a little weird because every response is a little different. Sometimes we're frankly just lacking that. Or for example, so like we get this all the time in Pat Live. Hey, I need to sell this property by May 15th. Can you guys do that? All right, so it's like super urgent. Like we got like 15 days or something like that. I wanna to speak to that in our messages, uh, text, email, obviously on the phone. So it's just like those little subtleties in terms of making it bespoke to the seller. And again, going back to like that more problem solving mindset. And I think when, when, again, when we look at like quote unquote competition in the land space, you guys have probably experienced this at some point if you guys are doing deals or a decent amount of deals where the seller says, you know what? Hey Jay, I've been getting a lot of letters recently, but you, I just like you. I don't know. I just feel like we got a good thing going. I want to sell to you, Jay. I know this happened in the, even in the 90 day challenge just happened with Dennis and Rob. We heard that multiple, multiple times. I think it's partially because they're good at acquisitions. Um, and so that's just like a, a way to set ourselves apart, right? We are in a commodity business. A lot of people run their business very in a very similar fashion. So when that seller is getting similar letters, similar drip, drip texts and emails, and then you come along with that bespoke message, 
that's a little more true to their problem, I think it just resonates on a much, much deeper level. And beyond that, it's just more effective. Um, hard, definitely hard to do, right? I think if you are a solo operator, there is definitely a question to ask yourself of, is it just better to, to automate and sacrifice response rate in the name of being lean and mean and being able to handle the, the number of leads that you have coming in? You could make that argument. I'm more of the mindset of if you are scaling marketing and you have a lot of leads coming in, just learn how to hire and get some, get a butt in that seat to do that. You don't even need a, an acquisition manager per se. Um, if you want to do bespoke text and email and you're doing the calling, you could still do that with like an intake manager or a generalist VA. But it doesn't really take much to solve for that. I think if you're running into that issue where that question does pop up, it's probably a better indicator that it's time to hire. Um, and we've just seen we've just seen substantially better results. But I think beyond that, though, what we've really seen the biggest uh, kind of bump in the number of deals that we get is this cadence here, just working them tirelessly. My little the little slogan that I love to say is like, we're not salesy in our conversations, but we're very salesy with our follow up. As in, we're extremely aggressive with our follow up. We just don't stop. We got a deal. <laughs> we got a deal this week actually that we've been working since December. There's over a hundred phone calls. And I don't even know how many texts and emails with a seller. Uh, and a lot of that was just the initial trying to penetrate and just get the person to, to get in touch with us. I don't think most people are doing that. And that's a deal that will make us at least 60 K. Um, it's just work that's worth doing. Uh, let's talk about the warm lead, hot lead. Look at everyone's got their own uh, kind of interpretation of warm leads, hot leads. Some people also really like to like extend those stages. So it's like lukewarm lead, very warm lead, extremely hot lead. I'm of the mindset there's really two, there's really two categories, right? Oh, we got another person joining. I don't know why you guys keep on leaving and joining again. <laughs> Let's see. All right. Um, I'm of the mindset that simple wins and there's really only kind of like two categories that leads fall into in my opinion so a warm lead in my book is we presented an offer and the conversation is still going doesn't mean they've accepted the offer but we presented an offer and we haven't like they didn't scream and hang up on us okay we're still in the game that's a warm lead right like what we know moves the needles with sellers or just in terms of our results in general is like how many offers can we get out there how quickly do we get those offers out there so if we make an offer to a seller and we're still in the conversation, we're still in the game, that's a warm lead in my book. Now a hot lead is obviously we've made that, that offer. They're in the warm lead section. A hot lead is, hey, there is intent to sell in the next 30 days. Now we don't always know perfectly, but typically we're gonna start talking about next steps. We're gonna start talking about getting a contract and we're gonna start talking about selling. Um, and so you know, roughly we're gonna be like in the here and now. Now, if I make an offer to a seller, and maybe they oblige and they like the offer, but you'll hear this from time to time. Ah, you know what? I've got a lot going on in my life right now. I need six months. We actually have this happening right now with a subdivide deal in Texas. We've been working this lead since the fall of last year, off on, off on, off on. We're at the point where we've come to terms with an offer, but they're selling another property and they need roughly about six months. And so there's still a warm lead in my book. Um, here, I think you guys can kind of leave it up to interpretation. You guys can change those stages. You guys can add stages. I've just found that simple wins for our team. I used to have a multitude of different uh, cold, warm, hot, different stages. And my team just never adhered to them. They just frankly weren't effective anymore. And so like, when we look at a CRM, it only works if your team adheres to it. So if your team is populating the stages correctly, doing the task, putting in the notes, that's when it's actually effective. But if you've got the most robust, beautiful staging, but they're not actually doing it, it just, it just doesn't doesn't do anything. Um, so I found that for us, simple wins. I know some people like a little more complex in terms of breaking down those different stages. Okay, let's talk about the inventory side of things. Very simple. Uh, this is the exact process that we use on every deal, unless it's a self-closing, it's gonna be a little different. So we send it to title. We go and get the title commitment. Once we get the title commitment, it's pre-listing time. So you guys will see in the pre-listing section, let's just take this deal here. You guys will go see what's what's included inside of a pre-listing, draft listing content, add PDR, CTA to listing, uh, schedule drone photographer, gather map right, Google Earth images, finalize list price, upload to non-MLS platform. So for that pre-listing, we're not going to go take it to the MLS, but we are certainly going to put it on our website, land.com, landflip. The best case scenario is 
We're closing the property. We've already got a buyer lined up. And that happens to the pre-listing process. But back in the day, we went and said, hey, pre-listing, or we send that to title, it's pre-listing time. We got ourselves in a few sticky situations where we got a buyer and the title commitment came back and there's something wrong. Trade on titles messed up, access is messed up. They had an IRS lien or whatever it may be. And so I think that I would really recommend everyone to just adhere to this process. It's been tried and true and it works pretty darn good. Closed and listed, and that's relatively obvious. All right, let's talk about the buyer side of things. Buyers, much, much simpler. Usually with buyers, and in most case, it's yes today, it's yes in the future, or it's just no, right? So buyer inquiry, qualify means that we've actually spoken to the seller. Nurture means um, we're looking to close in the next 30 days, and then closing means, hey, we're sending this off to actually close on. That's really it. I've found that with sellers and with buyers, it's pretty much the same thing. If they're not willing to close the next 30 days, it, it's just, it's not a hot opportunity, right? And you'll get derailed by over stuffing those kind of hot categories, whether it's nurture or, or hot leads for sellers. If you start stuffing those with deals that really don't belong there because the timelines are much longer, I think that your, uh, your communication, the communication just gets ineffective. It's just ineffective and your team frankly just doesn't adhere to it. So my rule of thumb for my team is when we go look at nurture or hot leads, I don't want to see that crammed with, with deals or opportunities because it's usually not the case. Usually at any given time, we've got one to five leads in nurture and we usually have a little more in acquisitions because we over index on acquisitions, typically less than 25 hot leads in acquisitions. If I start seeing that balloon, I don't, A, I just don't think it's realistic unless we've really bumped our marketing. Uh, and if that's the case, maybe, but in most cases, it's just not, not gonna happen. Um, let's go look at the, the property section here. Uh, so this is where you guys are gonna actually go and upload your data. Um, one thing to note, everything that's gonna be uploaded here has to be a CSV file. So you can't go and upload an Excel file when you're using Excel or Google Sheets, you guys can go and download as a CSV. You guys will upload it here. It's going to go and ask you a few questions. Um, let's go see here. Oops. Uh, it's going to go and ask you a, a few questions in terms of like the merge field. So it might say, hey, we think this is the owner one first name. Is that true? And you guys will have a little toggle and say yes, no, or drop down uh, and choose which one it is. I will say the platform almost always gets it right. They do a really, really good job with um, placing the merge fields correctly, but you guys do want to spot check that. Uh, you guys will get these little campaign codes in here. So I don't know who here, if you guys are mailing through Pebble, put it in the chat. I'm, I'm curious to know. I think most people probably aren't. Um, whether you're mailing through Pebble or you're not, we still upload all of our data here as the first stop. We export it. When you export it, you guys are going to get these little um, campaign codes and you'll send that off to the mail house. We want to make sure those campaign codes are there. So you don't want to go and send the property to Rocket Print Mail or send the data to Rocket Print Mail and then upload here. You're not going to have those same codes. Those same, these codes are what we're going to use to really search across the board. Uh, it's also one of the questions that are going to be asked through Pat Live. And so those go and create all of this for you. We used to, used to have to do it manually. It's a real pain in the butt. They do that all for you here. Um, they'll also clump properties together as well. And what I mean by that is if you go and say, hey, we've got a thousand records. We didn't remove duplicate owners. Anyone that's a duplicate, it'll just kind of compress it, right? So it'll put it into one. So you guys can go make one letter offering on all the properties to the seller. It's actually a really cool feature. So typically what we do, if we're going to go after portfolios, we'll usually have one APN and speak to the fact that we'd be interested in buying more. We kind of play coys if we don't know. This is cool because it'll clump it all together here um, and it'll, it'll show all the APNs and it'll show, hey, we're looking, we're intending to buy the whole portfolio from you. Um, let's see if there's anything that I'm missing here. Let's talk about the, the difference in terms of mailing through Pebble versus mailing through other platforms. I think there's actually a time and place to use both. So I would never recommend doing volume through Pebble. It's just expensive. I think for a two-page letter, you guys will pay 62 cents versus 52 cents through Rocket Print Mail. That compounds, it'll save you a ton at the end of the year as you start doing you know, six figures plus in mailing quantity. Um, now, what we do use the Pebble mailing feature for, though, is like one-off campaigns. So you guys can go in, if you want to send a letter to one owner, whether it's a follow-up letter or another offer, you guys can do that directly through the platform. We typically use click to mail to do that. And again, this goes back to the idea of kind of consolidating all of these tools under one umbrella. I think what you create there is just better adherence for your team to actually use all these features. Uh, so we can go send follow-up letters. We can go send another offer if we have to. We get a lot of old sellers that can't use the computer. You guys just go and send that through Pebble. You guys need to update an offer or what have you. Uh, same thing with neighbor letters. 
What's cool here is that there's no minimum. So when we go and do neighbor letters with Rocket Print Mail, you typically have to wait to hit that minimum, which is a little bit frustrating. There's no minimum here. So for neighbor letters, for these one-off mailers, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, you guys can do a one-page letter through Pebble relatively cheaply. I think it's in the high 50 cent range. Uh, some land investors use one page. Most of us use two pages. But I think all in all, it just makes more sense to use a rocket print mail that it's just going to be substantially cheaper. Uh, what is cool, though, is if you guys do mail through Pebble, the tracking features will be will be a lot better since it's all uh, under Pebble. Uh, if you guys go through the setting section here, you guys will see some of the templates that we use inside here. Neighbor letters, blind offers, blind offer letters, neutral letters, all that stuff. Uh, they also have some of their own uh, deeds and whatnot. Uh, outbound warranty deed, inbound warranty deed. I've never used these. Uh, for us, all of our contracts typically for, on the dispo side are gonna come from a realtor or we'll use a platform um, like Law Depot to go and draft those up state specific. We use that for our financing agreements, purchase agreements, all that jazz. On the acquisition side though, we do just use the same basic stock and standard purchase agreement that pretty much everyone uses. That's really favorable to the buyer. We obviously don't use that on the dispo side. Um, the website section. So I don't think most people here are at the, the place where they need a website. But again, going back to creating that defensible moat around your business, I think there's a point in time where you certainly should add a website. The reason being is, again, going back to that dispo kind of conundrum, uh, those platforms are going to continue to get more expensive, more competitive. And so having a website over time, you'll start to actually rank on Google. We've had our website for four years now. We built it through the Pebble uh, WordPress template. And last I checked, I think we get like 5,000 to 7,000 visits a month. Some of that's organic. Some of that comes from other platforms, but we get a ton of leads that are essentially free that just come from that SEO that we've built up. And then same thing with sellers, having some level of credibility where they can go to see that you are a real business. I mean, it's a, it's kind of a faulty notion, but a lot of people think, well, if they have a website, they're probably a real business, right? If you don't have a website, you will catch some flack. So actually a recurring theme in the beginning for us was like seller said, hey, I tried Googling you. And I just found your Facebook. That's kind of weird. Or I just found your Instagram. It's kind of weird. There's no website there. Uh, the other thing too is like for websites, whether it's with buyers or it's with sellers, it's just really a way to house social proof, right? Just social proof on social proof on social proof. Uh, that's going to go a long way. So if you have like an acquisition landing page, load that up with video testimonials. They can be testimonials from sellers. Frankly, they can be testimonials from anyone that's done some level of business with you. I mean, I can make you a testimonial, right? Um, I might not speak to selling land to you, but just having something there that shows you're a real business and you have people that have worked with you and can vouch for you uh, is really helpful. Uh, to go back to that SEO side of things too, so like the, the templates that they have set up with WordPress are all SEO friendly. I'm not like an SEO wizard by any means, um, but what happens is you guys will start ranking for keywords just by having all those property listings. And so I don't know where we rank for all the search results, but I think if you look up Costilla County or what have you, because we've sold so many properties there and they're all stored on our website and they're so keyword rich, we do rank for those. And so people will go find that link through Costilla County and they maybe just want land in Colorado and they go through this tripwire of going through our website, they opt in, we own their information. I think someone that's done a really good job of this, if you guys go look at a company called Landio, but, you know, in my opinion, there's two different ways to build businesses, right? There's the direct response method, which is really what all of us are doing here. And there's the brand building perspective, right? So a direct response business means you're going direct to the consumer or to the customer uh, through some kind of marketing channel. You usually have almost no brand. Um, and it's a little more cutthroat. It's a little more just crunching numbers, right? We spend this much on marketing. We need to get this much on the back end. Usually those businesses, unfortunately, just don't really put a lot of time or thought in brand or customer experience. And there's the brand building side of things. Think about like a Coca-Cola, right? You're never gonna get a, a direct mail piece from Coca-Cola saying, buy our stuff. You're never gonna see a Lamborghini ad on TV. That's just not how, they don't need to market that way. They've got such a strong brand. And so I think like, if I had to go and say, this is the most sustainable way to build a land business, what I would tell everyone here is you're going to start direct response. Use that. Get money in the door, build a business. But while you're doing that, build your brand, both through a website and through social media. I know it's cliche because everyone talks about it, but the number of deals I just get through social media is pretty astounding, uh, just from other land investors or random people. Uh, but also, 
um, for sellers or for buyers. And so what's happened with Landio is they went, they did exactly that. They went direct response, direct mail, all that stuff, just like us, started building a brand. I don't even know if they do direct response anymore. What's happened is now the vast majority of their deals come directly from their website. If you guys go look up on similar web, their website traffic is bananas. And so they're getting so many deals submitted to them on the acquisition side. They said, okay, there's a lot of money to be made here. Some of these deals, frankly, just don't pencil for us to take the land investing model. So they went and launched a, a, a nationwide brokerage. So when those deals come in, they got two exit strategies. Hey, we'll take them down internally, or we'll go and list them as an agent. And so they just convert a, an immense amount of deals just through this. I think, frankly, the vast majority of all their deals come through here now. Same thing on the disposition side, right? They go and post an Instagram post, and it, it'll get hundreds of thousands of views in the first day. Same thing with a YouTube video. Their deals sell in hours. And these are big, big, big properties. And so when I think about competing with, with Landio, it's like, well, really, you can't unless you have a brand. Uh, they're so big, in fact, that they've actually, they're like sponsored by Toyota and all these big companies. And so I think they've, they're a really good case study on like, if you wanted to build the most sustainable land business, the playbook is this. And they've done that both for acquisitions and they've done it both for dispositions. So what that ties into is I would recommend if you're looking to get a website, it's a pretty simple solution to plug into this. I think it's like $300 a year. It's relatively cheap. Um, if I'm missing anything here, I think that's that's a, a, a pretty good breakdown. Let's, let's roll into questions. Let's see how long we ran here. Yeah, we're about an hour and a half in. Let's roll into questions um, and we can riff a little bit further on any of this stuff, but I wanna hear what you guys uh, have on your side in terms of questions. Hey, Sumner, it's Jay again. I've got a question for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just I just dropped this in the chat, but I'll ask it to you now. So um, and you you may not be the person to ask this. This is probably a Jesse question, but um, is everybody on your team able to export data from Pebble? So when you go and and like you've got your pricing info and you've got your mailer code and all this data, the data that you paid for and the yep. pricing work that you've done is up there and anyone with your with the access to your Pebble can export all that information, right? Yeah, as it stands, stock and standard, everyone can export it. In terms of like putting guidelines for certain users, I don't know if that exists. You know, something that like, for example, we do that inside data tree. Hey, this person can't pull these reports or do X, Y, and Z. Uh, talk to me about your fear around that, though. Are you worried that someone's going to go share that with other people or what have you? Well, yeah. I mean, like, so so all the value uh, right now is is in the data that I've spent money on and the yep. uh, and the hours I put into pricing these mailers. Yep. And, that, and now basically anyone on my team can just go click select all, export tens of thousands of pieces of yep. data point and all the pricing and, and just go mail at half the cost. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, that would definitely be a Jesse question. That's one of those things that seems like a no brainer to have some kind of guidelines. I, I don't know if it exists currently. And again, I think that like when I look at Pebble, it was really built initially for those land geek type investors, those people that frankly don't have a team or maybe one or two people on their team. You know, as your team grows, it becomes pretty important. I would say initially, like for your first few hires, because you're gonna have such a strong pulse on these people, there's probably very little risk there. When I look at my business now, though, is that we have people that help us with the hiring and I'm less involved with it. I think that's when the concern starts to, to arise because, yeah, we will get some bad actors in our business and people that do have bad intentions. I will say, though, for where you're at, Jay, I would be pretty shocked if you really hired a lemon. I think that you would know pretty quickly who's who. But it would be a good question to ask Jesse. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and if you guys have questions, feel free to raise your hand and we can go through them together. Uh, we actually just got... A, uh, a contract signed while we're on this call as well. I always love when we're on these calls and contracts get signed. I feel like it's a testament to the work that we do here. Uh, anyways, you got a question, Andy? I'll tell you about to say something. Oh no, Ray's got a question. Yeah, I just had a clarifying question about the mailing codes. Did you say that even if you're not mailing through Pebble, if you're mailing through Rocket Print, that you can produce a mailing code through Pebble and use that? Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. So you'll upload the data there. It'll produce that mailing code automatically. Then you'll export that data set and it'll have that code on there. Gotcha. So when they hit Pat Live and they give you that code, it's in your CRM already? Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. 
And so that'll be one of the questions too in that Pat Live form. I think they actually, and we'll, I think we, we go through that in the 90 day challenge video with Jesse. I believe they have a pre-populated, pre-set up Pat Live form already inside Pebble for you guys to use. There's a Leah Pat Live script though, isn't there? One specific. There is, yeah, so well, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's a Leah Pat Live script and then they have like a, a stock and standard intake form. And one of those questions is about the mailer code. And then you guys can obviously create your own and input them into the script, the right questions on there. Um, most, I mean, frankly, most of these are gonna have pretty similar questions. What I find more times than not is like if people aren't using your script, they're usually just asking too many questions and they're just like burning up minutes. Um, David, you got a question? Uh, yeah. Hi, nice to meet you, dude. Uh, yeah. Going this week. Well. Um, I'll see you in Vegas too. Um, yes. Maybe this is not a pebble question. This is something you touched on just earlier about social proof and social media and websites and stuff. And yep. um, it's always a kind of been always on the corners of my attention about what kind of approach to take. Like as a somebody who's done maybe a couple, two, three deals here, um, you know, I don't have really any kind of authority to talk about my like to train other investor type people on our side and i also i'm not so like i don't really know what to broadcast out there you know it's just a, kind of a big sort of black cloud for me like am i talking to other investors on my social platform whatever that is or am i talking to people who might want to sell me land like my you know or like people who might be want to invest with me like my friends on instagram or something it's just like kind of like yeah, yeah. you're talking about social proof on a website or in terms of social media just like just building a general social presence with your business yeah. you know like because your content is geared towards us other investors as a leader what is that the is that what you really feel like is the is is social proof to show people who are investigating you who might want to sell you their land gotcha yeah so uh two different kind of I mean, they do feed into each other, but I think I've got two different definitions for them. And I'll, and I'll give you advice in terms of what I would do. So when I talk, when I'm talking about social proof on a website and what have you, I'm talking about social proof from people that have worked with you that fit into the avatar of whoever's visiting the website. So if you go over to our website, that's all geared to buyers, right? And so you'll see little snippets of people's experience that have worked with, worked with us. So that's, that's some social proof there. So when Google's asked, they can go see a Google reviews page. That's all just organic social proof that people have shared. Hey, I had an amazing experience, yada, yada, yada. Um, one of the things that we first started doing in the beginning, and frankly, like we probably don't beat this drum hard enough anymore, is any person that bought a deal from us, hey, can you tell us about our, your experience? Was it good? Was it bad? See what they say. If they say, if they have a positive experience, would you mind if we use this as a review? Or would you mind if you write us a review and give them the link? We would. Oh, the trigger though is like, Okay, ask if they had a good or bad experience. If they had a bad experience, don't ask for a review, but resolve that problem with them. But if it was, hey, we had a great experience, cool, can we use those words on our website or could you write us a Google review wherever, right? And what we would do is like, if they just said, hey, I don't wanna write a review, but they said, yeah, you can use the, the email I sent, copy that text, put it on your website in parentheses, Joe Schmo had an amazing experience is what they had to say. If they say, hey, I will leave you a Google review, let them go and do that. They'll go put that on your Google review page or BBB, whatever you want to use. I will actually copy and paste that review and put that on our website as well. So you kind of get a double whammy effect. I do think that having either a Google reviews page or a BBB page, it's not a requirement, but the day and age we live in is a day and age of like transparency for consumers. And so I do think it, I think it probably helps more than hinders, frankly. Um, so when I'm talking about social proof, that's what I'm talking about. In this example, same thing for acquisitions. You got your landing page for sellers. Can we get like a video or a, a quick uh, breakdown from someone's experience working with us? Now, the truth is, if you're a new land investor, that might be hard to do, right? So, what I would recommend is you go talk to someone in the group and say, "Hey, could we do this for each other? I'll record you a video, you record me a video." Now, you guys have never done a deal together, so it's not why, but they could say, "Hey, David is an amazing land investor." one of my favorite people in this industry. He does such a good job. He's prompt with his communications. He always does what he says he's gonna do. Okay, it's generic, but we can absolutely use that for social proof. Really, social proof is like peacocking, right? You know what peacocking is? Yeah, yeah, it's like peacocking. People aren't gonna literally go and watch that video and like take notes on it, but well, he said this, but he didn't say that. They just wanna see, have other people worked with David? 
And so we want that both on acquisitions and dispositions. And you might have to fluff it a little bit in the beginning. But my favorite thing is every customer, seller, buyer, when they come to us, when we do a deal, ask them, how is their experience? A, that's just good customer service. But then that opens up the conversation to getting social proof. People typically won't just organically go and leave you reviews unless they had a bad experience, right? Negativity is a way stronger emotion. So people are going to let you know about how bad their experience was. They rarely will let you know how good the experience was. Uh, I think you can't start on that early enough. Like start collecting that stuff from the beginning. Go look at most land investors' websites. They have like zero, zero social proof, right? Um, you go over to landinvestor.co. What do you see on the homepage? You see videos from other people's experience because it's it's super, super important. Um, now let's go, let's talk about the social media side of things. So in the case of like what we create in terms of content, I never created that for sellers or for buyers. Like the sole intention was to build a community and to work with other land investors, right? The ancillary benefit that came from that though, is it's created like this authority figure where sellers see our YouTube all the time, buyers see our YouTube all the time. And then also other land investors see it and they say, hey, I can't join the coaching program right now or I, I'm already coached up, I don't need it. But I've got this deal and you seem like you know what you're talking about, so I wanna partner with you. Now, I don't think the easiest route to building a social presence is to go and make YouTube videos about land investing, right? What I would do if I didn't wanna go that route is I would just share what you're doing, right? This is how I got started. I would literally just share on Instagram mainly Film a quick story. I just got this deal. This is what happened. This is the good part about it. This is the bad part about it. This is what we made on it. Crazy story. And just, just share that, right? And what happened is I started sharing that in 2020. We initially got private money. So we got investors from it. Then we got people that are asking about coaching. So we started taking on coaching clients. Then I started really making content and we built Leah. And then we started getting just deals inbound left and right, right? I got a deal from a total stranger on Instagram, probably. I don't know, four weeks ago, total stranger reaches out to us, says, hey, I've been watching your content for a long time. I can't afford the program, but I took your advice. I've been cold calling this list of leads. And in fact, I got two properties. In total, it's a buy for $210,000. It's subdivided inventory. So that I know you've been looking for subdivided inventory in Texas. I want to partner on, you with, on this with you. I want you to fund it. I want you to teach me and we can do 50-50. The deal is probably worth, I don't know, $500,000, dollars $500, And that happens at this point, it's a couple of times a week. Those I don't do all those deals, but deals just start getting sent to you. You don't have to have a coaching program to, to have that happen. And I get people that aren't even land investors that are like, dude, my grandpa's got a farm that he's selling right now. Like, would you want, would you be interested in buying it? I think the most immediate benefit to, to anyone here that's on this call about sharing content is really private money. Like, that's what's gonna happen first. People are gonna say, I'm too busy. I don't want to learn this, but I definitely want to give you money because his returns are crazy. So what I started doing is I would just, every time we sold the deal, I put up an Instagram story said, Hey, we bought this five acre in Joshua tree. We bought it at X. We sold it at a Y. It's how long we took. It took to sell. And I would never say come invest with us, but naturally people would start reaching out. Uh, so I think there's a ton of ancillary benefits nowadays too, is like when we get sellers and buyers that fill out forms and reach out to us, they say, so interesting, I Googled you guys and I watched Sumner's YouTube videos for an hour. You seem like a pretty nice guy. I want to work with you guys. So that happens as well. People start to get to know your personality. So I mean, like just across the board, sharing is like the upside's infinity and the work is minimal. So it's just like a win-win across the board. I could not stress it enough. And that is, you're right, that is a form of social proof. But when I'm talking about social proof on a website, I'm talking about literally reviews from other people. You can tell I'm passionate about that topic because it's literally free to do and it's so impactful. Whether it's you just like so a, you like a site, like a simple site, like on Pebble, or I my CRM is called Razaroo, but it's basically like sort of the same wireframe as a lot of these general CRMs that have a pipeline set up, yeah. but they have like a website functionality that you can set up and and throw little testimonials on and stuff like that. I mean, or carrot, I don't know if you have an opinion about carrot. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I used carrot when I first got started. I thought frankly, carrots kind of black. I mean, the problem with carrot is every website looks, there's like three variants. I mean, maybe, maybe they've changed it, but they, they all look the same. Like when I see a land investor, I'm like carrot website. All right. I know you're just getting started. Um, so I mean, it, it works. Here's what I would recommend to someone for your dispo website. You could just use any WordPress template. You could use uh, Pebbles template. Uh, really, what you really all you need is like a like an e-commerce template. You could even use Shopify, right? It just 
imagine you're selling some kind of goods online and we're just going to put land into it. You can really easily hire someone on Fiverr or onlinejobs.ph if you're using WordPress in particular to code up like a GIS map so it integrates in. Like so just some really simple stuff, a Google Earth map. So you can have like a mapping function and then you can just use like the standard setup there. Um, one of the things too that I forgot to add that I think is really important about websites, every month we get, I don't know, one to 10 deals that just organically sell on our website from a total stranger that's never talked to our team. And so what you also do is you create a buying environment where someone can buy without your input because there's a checkout cart function. Now someone can't go buy a $100,000 property directly, but they can place the holding deposit or they can put the, the down payment for financing. And so you give someone the ability to buy. You also remove a lot of the friction in the buying process. So whether they come in organically and we never talk to them, that's one thing. But what happens beyond that is my my uh, dispo manager's on the phone and she's saying, okay, so you want the property. So this is what you're going to do. Go over to landpioneer.com. You'll scroll down. You'll see this button. Place the holding deposit. We'll draft to the document, blah, 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 blah. You make it really easy. Back in the day, I was like, yeah, mail me like a cashier's check or send it into title. We'll do earnest or all these weird very complex, annoying things for the buyer. You just make it, you make it just too complex. So remove that friction. A website allows you to do that. Um, so that's what I would do on the dispo side, some kind of e-com setup. I would, for holding deposits and down payments, I would use Stripe, but I'd plug it into Moonclerk. I've been blocked from Stripe more times than I can count. And like every business I've ever ran, uh, they seem to hate me. But the worker, and Stripe is against doing any real estate transactions. For whatever reason, if I plug Stripe into Moonclerk, I never get flagged. And Moonclerk is just like a checkout link setup. And so it's just like a really easy way to go check out. Uh, you can create like payment plans and stuff like that on there. And so that's why I would use for collecting those holding deposits, document prep fees. That's the other thing. By having a website, we can charge a document prep fee. So if I go and send off the deal a title, I can't say, hey, seller, you also got to pay me 250 bucks for a document prep fee. But if I buy it from the website, I can, I can make that up. So every year, I mean, we add twenty-five thousand to fifty thousand dollars, and literally free money from that two hundred fifty dollars document prep fee on every property we sell. That's like that pays for the website tenfold and more, right? Um, so that's also a nice thing too. You can be a little more in control of the transaction. Now, on the acquisition side, I would use like a lead pages or just like a really simple landing page builder. Uh, one of my favorite uh, websites. I'll put this link in the chat for you guys. Something called Card. It's C-A-R-R-D. It's like $12 a month. It makes the simplest one-page websites you've ever seen. I'll put this in the chat for y'all. Um, Card is awesome. And so that's what I would use on the acquisition side for, for sellers. Uh, if you guys are using Facebook Marketplace too, you guys can create landing pages specific for different platforms as well. So if someone's coming from Facebook Marketplace, you could create a funnel for them to go through. Whole different can of worms, but having a website is important. Any questions on that, Dave? No, thank you. That was a lot. Um, and That's I haven't so. gone through the program yet, but uh, are, when you say that your dispo site, I mean, in the training, are you training people generally to dispo themselves or like to use agents or sort of both or whatever? Yeah, dude, this is like the, this is the age old question, especially nowadays. It seems like a lot of people are transitioning to realtors only. Um, okay, this, this is how I think about it. At the end of the day, like this is really all just sales and marketing. Like fill in whatever widget we're selling, it happens to be land, just all sales and marketing, and a little bit of like operational kind of complex thing, which means it's really just all sales and marketing. The problem with realtors is they don't sell, right? So there are properties that definitely demand having a realtor, in my opinion. Big tracks of land, they're gonna get driven on a quad through the property or um I don't know, really big price points. So there's a gate that the realtor needs to take them through. There's a time and a place to use realtors. I think especially in the beginning too, just the convenience of delegating that work without having that payroll hit is important. I think though that like, if you want to build a big land business, I just don't know how you wouldn't have dispositions internal. Because dispositions internally, we can sell. And we can sell hard. And we can follow up aggressively. Realtors don't follow up. They get the lead, they call them, they're done. The other thing is if you use realtors, you don't own that leads information. So we're never building that list. The realtor owns that information. And so I think that like, there's some real pros and cons to both sides. The other thing is if you're doing volume, realtors are going to become extremely expensive. You know, paying out five to 10% is going to be a lot more uh, than, than a dispositions manager. So what we do and what I would advise to most people is you're typically going to start, you should over index on acquisitions. 
Don't even think about dispositions, right? Just use realtors. You start doing 300, 500K a year, you got plans to really grow this thing. I would bring dispositions internal. I would still use realtors selectively. So that's how we do it, right? We've got dispositions internal, but we still say, hey, there's some properties we wanna use realtors. Realtors, while they're terrible at sales and don't really do much selling, they do add benefits in terms of like market analysis, telling you where to mail, telling you price points. So like they, they add more value than just that, um, than just like showing the property. I think that's that's the, probably the best roadmap. So most people are going to start realtors. They're going to go bring that internal and still use them for for select properties. Um, that's what I would recommend. The other thing too is that like, while most people are thinking about just doing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger properties, there is something to be said about having the the ability to do smaller properties, and you can't really do that unless you have you have a realtor. But in the beginning, whether it's your time. You should be spending almost all your time on acquisitions and very minimal on dispositions. And as you start hiring, same thing, all your hiring time and resources and thoughts should go to acquisitions. Like you should literally have like a four to one or like a three to one relationship in terms of like, we've got three acquisition managers and one dispo manager. Or that same thought applies just to time and attention that goes there. This is really what moves the needle. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't overwhelm you there. No, no, no. Uh, you know, it's one one bite at a time. Uh, you know, gets the watermelon. Yeah, yeah. And I would say, you know, this stuff isn't super relevant in the here and now for you. The dispo stuff is. I mean, my recommendation is use realtors initially, but some of that other stuff will come a little bit later. Anyone else have uh, have questions? Y'all want to go through? We got the skeleton crew here. Yeah, what's up, Ray? Yeah, just real quick, your recommendation for a website, I. I I sorry, I missed part of it. Card was if you didn't have a lot of money to spend, you say go that route, and your first choice would be Pebble, or you you don't like you don't like their website platform, or I kind of missed that part. Oh well, yeah, yeah. So I um I would I would break them up into two different camps. So we're gonna have the acquisition website and the disposition website. So Dispo, I think that the uh, Pebble website's awesome. Or the the WordPress template they have awesome, super cheap, pretty much plug and play. Like they have it custom for land investors. Like when you log into WordPress, it's like add your property here, put in the property's information. If you guys are using a generic um, e-com template, it's not going to be as intuitive. And frankly, you'll probably have to pay someone to help set it up for you. So the WordPress is 300 bucks a year, I believe. That's, that's really cheap. It's going to be way cheaper than getting website help. Um, on the acquisition side, you could use uh, a lead pages, which can be a bit expensive. Um, card.co is the recommendation I made because it's just really cheap. And they even have a free variant that you can use on card. And they just make really simple one page websites. And so it's like you could have like testimonial videos, an opt in form, a picture of yourself. That's it. Like very, very simple. Uh, and, and Ray, if you want to go like super lean and mean, you could even just on your letter just put the Pebble. Um, uh, sorry the the pebble intake form right so like for that for those custom forms that you can build you guys can just copy that link and you could put that in your letter or you could redirect it to a clean link or you could shorten the link and so if you just want to give someone the option of filling out a form online you can't house any social proof there but you can also use that in the interim and the here and now if you don't have a website wise recommendation again meet the person where they're at Right? It'd be like sending out a letter and saying, you can only email me. It's like, no, some people want to text you, call you, handwrite a letter or fill out a website form. What do you think about putting a fax on the offer letter too? I know it's old school, but do you run into like, say older <laughs> sellers? That still Dude, have I do. I get, I do get that request enough to where I should probably do something about it. I don't have, I don't, I don't, I don't even know how to work a fax machine, <laughs> but it, there's probably money that's being left on the table, frankly. I think it's cheap. I think it's for like 10 bucks a month or 12 bucks a month. Jerry just said he has one, but I think for 10 or 12 bucks a month, it'll go to an email. It'll like scan and go to your email and you can do it that way. It's probably money well spent, man. I, I think that's wise. That's, that's low hanging fruit because you can digitize it like you're saying. So yeah, I, I think I would do that. Cool. Yeah. Questions, anyone else? Was this helpful in terms of the, the Pebble breakdown? Yeah. Cool guys. Well, I guess we could call it here. 
I did a, a half marathon this morning, so I need to get some food in me and relax. I have a very chill weekend. Hope everyone has a good weekend themselves. Um, spend some time having fun, hanging out with friends, family, watch some modules, pick some markets, do all that jazz. Um, anyways, guys, it's great seeing everyone. Hope to see everyone here at the event. Landinvestor.co slash event. If you guys want to go secure your ticket. Uh, I think we've got almost 30 people that have signed up. So it's going to be pretty freaking awesome. I think we'll sell out here pretty quick. Anyways, guys, have a great weekend and uh, we'll talk soon. Bye, everyone.